Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. This is my first slush, and I have to say, pretty impressed. This is a pretty impressive venue, so really excited to be here and talk about all things metrics. So I just got a really warm introduction, but uh, I'm Jessica Lax, and I lead analytics for DoorDash and for Volt. Uh, so if you don't know, DoorDash and Volt are both technology companies that connect consumers with the best of their, of their local neighborhoods. Uh, and I've been with DoorDash for almost 10 years. So I started as a GM, and that evolved into my role leading analytics. Uh, and over the last 10 years, uh, we've evolved from a small startup to the large public company that we are today. Uh, and so I've learned a lot, and I've seen a lot as the company has changed over the years. But the one thing that hasn't changed is our data-driven approach to running our business. And so, since the early days, we've measured our performance, we've set goals around our key metrics, and that's what I'm here to talk to you all about today. S tracking the key startup metrics, some lessons from my experience at DoorDash. There we go. All right, so over the next 20 minutes, uh, we're gonna cover a few topics. So first off, we're gonna start with measuring what matters, why it's important, and, and how to do it. Uh, then we're gonna talk about five principles that I have for setting good goals, things that I've learned in my experience at DoorDash. Uh, and hopefully you can avoid some of the mistakes that I made uh, and not make them in your own careers. And then we're going to briefly going to cover who should own your metrics, uh, and then we'll close out the session. So let's get started. So measuring what matters. This is my favorite slide, by the way. That pasta looks amazing. Glad we're right after lunch. All right, so in this first section, we're gonna talk about why it's important for startups, really any company, to measure the right things. So we're gonna talk about why metrics and goals matter, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about how to select the right metrics, um, why you should track your goals and make them visible to everyone, and then we're going to talk about how to evaluate your metrics and iterate. So let's start with why metrics matter. Oh. There we go. So tracking the right metrics will objectively tell you if you're on the right track and how your company is doing. So whether you're small and searching for product market fit or you're scaling um, or you're a large company just trying to hit your goals every, every quarter, the numbers are a feedback mechanism. So these insights into performance will enable you to move fast and speed is a competitive advantage no matter what size your company is. So once you've identified the key metrics, you can set goals against these metrics. And then this helps your team to focus. It also helps your team to prioritize so that they can really move the needle for your business. So how do you pick the right metrics? Well, first think about your business model and how your product delivers value to its customers. So business models, fall into a few categories. You've got marketplaces like DoorDash and Volt. Uh, you've got e-commerce, enterprise models, SaaS, subscription. Uh, you've also got transactional models and advertising models. And so while the suggested top line metrics for different business models might, might vary, and you can find lots of information on what those should be online, the key metrics generally cover user acquisition, customer engagement, revenue generation, and operational efficiency. So, and the suggested approach that I'm gonna talk to you about should work with most business models and most industries. All right, so what is this approach? The first thing to do to figure out what the right metrics are for your business is to think about how you deliver value to your customers. So we're going to use DoorDash as an example. So how does DoorDash deliver value to our customers? No pun, in no pun intended, but I do still get joy from it. So as a three-sided marketplace, uh, DoorDash actually has three sets of customers. We have consumers who are placing orders. 
we've got our delivery drivers that we call dashers, and we've got merchants. And so the value that we provide to consumers is being able to deliver their favorite restaurants, grocery stores, and, and local shops to their doorstep. For dashers, DoorDash provides flexible earning opportunities. And for merchants, incremental revenue uh, for, for the merchant. But all of this hinges on consumers ordering. There are fewer earning opportunities for dashers or couriers if people aren't ordering. And merchants are going to get less revenue if, if consumers aren't ordering. So it all hinges on the consumer ordering. And so that's where you're going to start. At least that's where we started. We tracked order counts. Uh, and for Volt, same thing. Order volume was the North Star metric. And you'll see that other marketplaces have similar metrics. So Airbnb has bookings, eBay has items sold, and Uber has rides. So from that North Star, we are going to embrace an annoying child, the one that always asks why incessantly over and over again, except we're going to ask what, more specifically, what drives. And what we're going to do is we're just going to keep asking what drives, starting with orders. So what drives orders? Well, it's the number of customers and the number of orders per customer. All right, so what drives customers? Well, it's the number of new customers and the number of existing customers that are ordering in a period. Well, what drives new customers? It's the marketing spend, paid CAC, that you're spending to acquire new customers. It is the number of organic customers that naturally come to your site or your, to your app. And it's the funnel conversion, so how many of those customers are actually converting to place an order. And so you just keep doing this over and over and over again. And what you're doing is creating a value driver tree. And so these become the inputs that you want to start to track. And generally what you'll find is that the root of this value driver tree and the, the different leaves or branches that are repeated most often are the things you really want to pay attention to. Those are the metrics that you really want to track. And so for DoorDash, we found that it was um, the number of orders, it was the number of new customers acquired, cohort retention, the number of merchants, our delivery times, the percent of late orders, uh, the customer star ratings, dasher efficiency, and we had a constraint metric of unit economics. And so you may not be surprised, but those metrics cover user acquisition, customer engagement, revenue generation, and operational efficiency. Uh, we did add a constraint metric. You heard me reference unit economics. Uh, constraints typically don't show up in your value driver tree. So this is a great opportunity to sort of put on the evil genius hat and think about how you might game the metrics. Uh, it'd be really easy to acquire a lot of consumers and have them order all the time if you gave away your product for free but you wouldn't have a sustainable business. So it's important to have a constraint. And for DoorDash, uh, we had goals around unit economics, both the revenue side uh, as well as the cost side. And we also included a uh, payback constraint for our marketing spend to make sure that we were spending that money efficiently. And so I encourage you all to take, to take the time and do the work to identify uh, your own value driver tree so that you can select the right metrics. But one of the things that you also have to remember, uh, Winston Churchill famously said that perfection is the enemy of progress, something I remind myself of often. So don't get worried about having the perfect and most complete value driver tree. It's most important to just start with what you think is best, and you can make changes along the way. All right, so you've ID'd all the input metrics, you've built your value driver tree, and you've selected the most important ones to set goals against. Well, now what? Well, now you want to make them visible to everyone. Uh, in our first office, uh, our first DoorDash office, uh, we had a TV screen that displayed a company door dashboard. That's what we called it. Uh, and we emailed a daily recap of this door dashboard to everyone in the, in the whole company. 
all you know, 50 of us. Um, and we regularly reviewed our progress uh, so that we could identify what was working and find those things to double down on or accelerate. And also, to identify if we were missing our goals, we could figure out where the gap was and put together a plan so that we could get back on track. Everyone in the company knew what our top metrics were and how we were performing against them. And it was one of the sort of origins of our company value, one team, one fight, which remains a company value today. All right, so after all that, I want to give a little bit of a public service announcement or warning, which is that you're going to get it wrong. Uh, hopefully not all wrong, but you're going to get it wrong. Uh, and the important thing is to figure out why you were wrong. Um, you, what matters is identifying the metrics that maybe aren't giving the right signal and are giving too much noise, or, or the metrics that you just don't pay attention to that much because they just really ultimately aren't important to what's driving your business. As your business evolves, you're going to learn new things about your customers, you're going you're gonna to add metrics, you're going to deprecate others, and that's completely normal. Um, at DoorDash, while many of our core metrics remain the same as that original list that I, that I gave, we got smarter about how to measure things. So for example, uh, I mentioned that number of merchants was something that we tracked. Um, what we found, though, was that some merchants are more valuable on the platform than others. Think about your neighborhood. The first Thai restaurant that we add in your neighborhood is going to have a much bigger impact on, on customer engagement than, say, the 16th Thai restaurant we add. Uh, and so what we needed to do was to change our metric, to evolve what we were measuring, to get a little bit more nuanced as we learned more about our customers. And so, as you get smarter, as time goes on, as you continue to iterate, you'll find the early indicators, uh, the, the proxy metrics that, that you can track in the short term and that are good, um, good forecasters for some of the longer term, more lagging indicators like customer retention and LTV. So if you start tracking kind of what you've got to go on, you learn, you iterate, um, and you sort of evolve the set of metrics that you're tracking, you'll find that you're more, uh, more able to, to manage the business and to find the right set of metrics for the stage that you're in at that time. All right, so we've talked a lot about tracking the right metrics, but what about setting goals? Goals are incredibly powerful. They can focus the team's attention on achieving a desirable outcome, which of course is what we want. So just remember that goals are not a to-do list. They're the final outcomes that, you're gonna lead, that are gonna lead your business to success. So once you've set these goals, you can then break them down into action items and key milestone with associated dates. Um, but that's a topic for a whole other talk. So over the years, I've learned a lot about setting, hitting, and yes, even missing goals. Uh, and so I tried to distill it down into five principles, things that maybe aren't talked about a lot. So here we go, we're gonna get started. Principle number one, good goals stretch us to perform at our best and put us on a course to win. Principle number two is good goals are simple. Principle number three, good goals drive incremental value. Principle four, good goals address the causal input metrics that drive the output metrics. And principle five is good goals incorporate the fail states. So we're gonna go through these one by one. All right, number one, good goals stretch us to perform at our best and put us on course to win. So we're going to start with the second part of that statement, because in this room, we are all winners. Uh, the question to ask yourself is, if you hit your goal, are you on track to succeed? If you or your team are hitting your goals month after month, quarter after quarter, but you're not capturing market share, or you're not really moving the needle to your North Star metric, you're probably measuring the wrong thing. 
And so a practical example of this is early on in our days, uh, the initial uh, search team goal was search conversion, which sounds like it makes sense. The search team is trying to build a better algorithm to improve search conversion. The problem is that some of the first projects were moving search conversion, but not overall conversion. And so was the team really adding value, or were we just simply shifting traffic from sort of one surface area in the app to another? Uh, in fact, to, to go to an extreme example, the search team could improve search conversion by making search really hard to find. So that only the you know, existing customers who were familiar with the, with the, with the app uh, or really high intent consumers would ever find it and would have naturally higher conversion. But th that's not the spirit of the goal. And so we had to figure out what would be the right goal to set for the search team so that we could see the ultimate goal we were looking for, which is an increase in orders, an increase in customer engagement. And so the, the idea is that you pick a goal that's going to drive business impact that's ultimately going to put you on course to win. And so that's what we have to start goaling our teams on. So moving to the first part of the sentence, which is good goals stretch the team to achieve more than they thought they could without being demotivated, of course. So if you're 1% behind goal, the things that you might do to get back on track are quite different if you were to say 10% behind goal. And so you want to, goals are typically seen as ceilings by teams. And so you don't want to unintentionally limit your team's potential by setting a goal that's too easy to achieve. So you're like, ah, I'm done, move on to the next thing. So if you set challenging goals, ones that make people feel a little uncomfortable, the team is forced to identify new and innovative solutions to problems so that you can achieve more than you even thought was possible. So in every planning cycle I've been a part of at DoorDash, the, the goals that were given seem completely <laughs> insane. Uh, and there's always a big gap between sort of the current course and speed of the business, where, where our business would naturally go and then where the goal is. But that's where the magic happens. That's when the teams need to come together to figure out how we're going to get from where we are today to where we need to be. And so even if the initial goal seems really hard, you'd be surprised how often the team can come together and figure out a way to solve for that gap. Uh, and ultimately, when looking back, realize they've done so much more than they ever thought that they could. And so setting, setting difficult goals for your team that really stretch them is one thing. But it's also good to pick sort of one area, particularly for a team that has a history of achieving goals, and set a BHAG. So BHAG stands for a big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, it, comes from, it comes from a book, uh, I believe, called Built to Last. And the idea here is that if you set sort of this big, hairy, audacious goal, then you can inspire the teams to get creative uh, and inspire radical change. And that it's when things are going well, so as I mentioned, for some of your top performing teams, when things are going well, that is when teams are most receptive to these sort of uh, aggressive goals. Um, and so pick your best team. It is true what they say. If you do good work, you just get more of it. But pick some of your best teams and pick one area to really set an aggressive goal and just see what your team can accomplish. All right, so principle number two is to keep your goals simple. This is something that I know my team uh, often has to remind itself, which is Sometimes in an effort to capture everything, you find the team setting a metric that takes you know, one thing from over here and 50% from over here and then the square root of this other thing into a big amalgamation of absolutely nothing. And so don't do this. Um, whenever possible, you want to keep things simple. If a goal is hard to explain, it leaves other teams and leaders unclear about what success looks like. If a, it can be hard to understand what moves a metric if it's complicated. And of course, for, for a team like mine, it can be really hard to explain why a metric moved if it's complicated. 
So complexity should be avoided whenever possible. Uh, simplicity guarantees the greatest level of user acceptance uh, and interaction. Never forget about incrementality. So principle number three is to make sure that your goal will drive incremental value. When we initially started running our new, uh, new consumer promotions, uh, when I was GM in Boston, our team measured the performance of campaigns based on the number of new consumers that we acquired. The problem with this is that it didn't account for the fact that many of those consumers would have joined DoorDash anyway, uh, even if we weren't running that promotion. But because we were, we just unnecessarily subsidized those orders. So, Incrementality is an important thing to incorporate into your goals. In a perfect world, we would only ever discount an order for someone who had no intention of ordering on the platform. Uh, but in reality, that's nearly impossible to do. And so what we need to, to look at, if you, if you look at this sort of test and control group on the side, you can see that the red people were going to order anyway. It's only the blue people that ordered just because we were running a promotion. But we have to pay for both the blue people and the red people. Uh, and so what you need to see is that the number of blue people make up for the cost of the promotion to both the blue and the red people. And so there are things you can do to improve incrementality with better targeting. But ultimately, we want to set our goals on driving the blue people, the, the incremental value that you get from, say, this promotion. And so um, the idea here is that you can set up an experiment, you can measure the incremental value, and set your goal based on, on that. And so in this case, you have a test and a control group running a true A-B test. Sometimes that's not possible. In this example, for the early days uh, in Boston at DoorDash, we didn't have the ability to run an A-B test, so we would do a match market test. You can also use difference and difference, synthetic control, or a number of other uh, quasi-experimental methods to try and measure the incremental value and goal your teams on that. All right, principle number four is to understand the causal input metrics that drive the output metrics. So it's common to dig in when you miss your goal. Teams want to know what happened. Did we, did we have a bad assumption? Was there a bad execution? Uh, does the causal mechanism exist, but we just haven't hit it yet? But it's equally as important to confirm the causal mechanism when things do work. So if you have a hypothesis, for example, that consumers uh, want fast delivery. And so you're testing whether a new carousel in the app that's sort by speed is going to improve conversion. And you run a test and you see that, yes, conversion went up. It's not time to pat yourself on the back and move on to the next thing. What you really want to know is, was it speed that led to that increase in conversion? So you should check to see if delivery times actually fell, and if that what caused that increase in conversion. So going back to the example I gave uh, on the search team with the bad goal of search conversion, let's say that the search uh, team rolls out a new search algorithm and actually does realize an increase in overall conversion. Now is the time to go and look to make sure that search conversion actually increased and is what's causing the increase in overall conversion. So it's always important to know the why and to validate the mechanism of change. Ooh, there we go. All right, so last but definitely not least is principle number five, which is don't ignore the fail states. So only looking at the averages will cause you to miss key insights. At DoorDash, we deliberately focus on the edges. We'll track the outliers. We'll look at the 90th percentile. Uh, we want to understand these fail states. Fail states can have a much bigger impact on your business than just their frequency might suggest. So looking at the edges can help you to identify bugs, uh, fraud, of course, and also can, can show you use cases that your, your consumers might be using your product for that you weren't even aware of. 
And so we monitor the edges to deliberately identify these fail, fail states, and then we set goals for ourselves to eliminate them. So a few common product examples of fail states could be uh, login failures, card declines, or credit card expiration, um, also account deletions, and of course, app restarts. So think about where your customers might encounter friction. Um, friction that is preventing them from realizing the value of your product. And then you want to measure these fail states and set goals so that you can eliminate them. All right, the last section is about metrics ownership. So do you need a VP of analytics or a data science leader to own your, to own your metrics and your goals? So my peers might not like this answer, but probably not, uh, at least not in the early days. So a feature of the startup team is that jobs are fluid and ambiguous and um, you know, people are doing things that maybe aren't in their specific career definition, but that's, that's what's fun about a startup. And so whether it's a finance person or an operator, a product manager, or even the CEO, really anyone can start uh, taking charge in defining what the right metrics are, defining those input metrics, creating your value driver tree, uh, and ultimately, everyone in the company should be tracking these metrics on a daily or weekly uh, cadence. And so, uh, you know, for DoorDash, things changed around our Series B when all of a sudden there were too many questions and the complexity of those questions were beyond what any sort of part-time finance person could handle. Uh, and so at this time, we had GMs like, like myself, uh, as well as our head of finance, who just needed some help to answer these questions, to identify what the drivers of our business were and how we could move them, to help us set up goals for different city launches, to know what a good launch looked like and develop that playbook. And so that was the, the impetus to, to the move from, for me from the a general manager to creating our biz ops team, which would ultimately become the analytics and data science team. And so just uh, some closing thoughts before we wrap things up. Um, while tracking metrics and setting goals are incredibly important, that is just the foundation. The real value is using that information to actually drive business impact. And so I always say, my job isn't to measure retention. I mean, it is to some extent. But the real value, the real job I have is to figure out how you take that retention curve you've just measured and shift it up. And so in conclusion, metrics and goals are incredibly powerful tools for driving your business uh, towards success. So be intentional about what you measure and make your metrics visible to everyone. And then when it comes to setting goals, remember these five principles. And, in, and lastly, and maybe most important, don't overthink ownership. Fill your team with smart, scrappy, analytical doers and just get started tracking those key metrics. Thank you so much.